the presentation of anarchism, anarchism. a social philosophy which aims at the emancipation, economic, social, political, and spiritual of the human race. The emancipation. Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. Recovering Redemption Maximus the Confessor, Anarchism, and Their Importance for Christian Ethics by Dr. Emma Brown Dewhurst. In 658 CE, a Christian monk called Maximus, who'd lived most of his life in a monastery outside of Carthage, was put on trial for treason against the Emperor of the Eastern Roman Empire in the city of Constantinople. The Emperor had passed a decree relating to the theology of Christ in an effort to put an end to theological differences dividing the Empire. Maximus objected and told Imperial officials that the Emperor was not a priest and so had no authority to decide Christian doctrine or force others to agree with him. There is evidence that Maximus even sent a letter to one of the Emperor's generals telling him not to fight on behalf of such a man. As a result of the trial, Maximus had his tongue and right hand cut off to stop him spreading his treason, and he died in exile some months afterwards. His theology later became upheld as orthodox, and he is remembered as one of the greatest theologians of the Church. He is recognised as a saint in the Eastern Orthodox, Catholic, Episcopal and Lutheran churches. His epithet, the Confessor, indicates one who has suffered for their faith. In his lifetime, Maximus the Confessor wrote extensively, building up a rich, complex theology, at the heart of which was a commitment to love which levels all differences between humans and envisions humans not as escaping the earth, but as tasked with uniting it and bringing it to God through reason and comprehension. This is not love in its contemporary romantic connotation, but love as the fulfilment of all virtue, a kindness and patience that is not envious, boastful, arrogant or resentful, and instead always inclines the heart towards those who suffer, to suffer with them, and to strive to alleviate their suffering. In a markedly different focus to most Latin Christian theologies, Maximus followed in a long-standing Greek tradition that emphasised the propensity of human nature for good. Human nature had become distracted by things that do not matter, wealth, material possessions, power, and the purpose of humanity was not to court these destroyers of human nature, but to learn to become truly human by loving one another and all creation. In loving one another, humans could come closer to uniting themselves, one another, and all the world to God. The practice of learning to love was thus essential to Maximus's thought. He anticipated a new life after the end of time in which people who had learned to become human would share in the divine, something that, in a way, was always intended for human nature. Thus, by learning to steer oneself away from the destructive inclinations, one could make space for virtue to shine forth in one's actions, something that was both a divine gift and a true completion of human nature. One might rightly ask what this has to do with anarchism. The answer might not be obvious at first, but Maximus's theology points one towards an understanding of love that has some very anarchic implications. Maximus articulates a dichotomy between love and self-love that represents the making or unmaking of the human person. Loving in this way is integral to becoming human and underpins purpose in the cosmos. By contrast, vice is characterized as destructive tendencies that tend to break the relations between creatures and God. Maximus calls this self-love, philautia, though this should not be confused with truly loving oneself, as per the directive to love one's neighbour as oneself. It is rather a destructive absorption of all around oneself, reorientating the world to serve oneself with no regard to anything else. In the same way that learning to love brings a human closer to becoming truly human, these destructive chasms of self-love unmake the human. They bring one closer to nothingness, and one becomes a destructive force in the lives of others. Thus, to accumulate power and wealth in and of themselves is understood as a failure to love, and one actively walks toward self-destruction. 
to borrow St Basil's words from the 4th century, is not the person who strips another of clothing called a thief? And those who do not clothe the naked when they have the power to do so, should they not be called the same? The bread you are holding back is for the hungry, the clothes you put away are for the naked, the shoes that are rotting away with disuse are for those who have none, the silver buried in the earth is for the needy, you are thus guilty of injustice towards as many as you might have aided and did not. Maximus's theology is favoured for its complex consideration of the human condition and its relation to God, but also for remaining grounded in the essential message of Christ and the outworking of day-to-day -day love as a part of struggle, ascasis, towards God. In the process of outlining what it might mean to derive an ethics from Maximus's theology, contemporary theologians have run into the problem that their situations, and particularly Christian relationship with the state, an instrument of violence, is unjustifiable under this theology. The question then is not so much what anarchism has to do with this monk from the 7th century, so much as what can anarchist theory and practice offer contemporary Christian theologians who are re-evaluating what their faith means in light of their interest in this ancient but rich theology and their present-day context. Anarchist theory could prove invaluable to a field of theology that is beginning to re-evaluate the larger implications of Maximian love and the nothingness of Philautia, and to de deconstruct the myth that the state is a necessary evil, and the role that the Christian tradition has played in propping this up. Christian theology has had an enormous impact on the shape of many states, and its values still underpin many morals, both in law and in the popular psyche. Critiquing the grounds for those, and the damage done by them, is thus an essential part of self-reflection within the Christian tradition, and the process by which the Church can begin to correct the many places that has deviated from its original purpose of love and comforting the afflicted. Oliver O'Donovan, a scholar of Augustine and renowned Christian ethicist, writes that humans live in a fallen world, and that subsequently our actions and the societies we live in will have a fallen character to them. He implies that to dream of doing better is tantamount to assuming that a human can take on divine responsibilities. He uses this position to justify Christian sanctioning of the state itself, and most famously just war theory, where a Christian is even morally obliged to support state-sanctioned murder under certain conditions. This characterization of the fallenness of human nature imagines, in almost Hobbesian fashion, that the state, law and order are the last line of defence reigning in debased humanity, which can only be contained in something vaguely resembling goodness by the boundaries of structured civilizations. An extremely important counter to this theological condemnation of human nature, then, comes from Maximus, who saw nature as something that is progressively recovered, and something that ultimately desires to do good, but has become lost along the way. Maximus also believed in the fallenness of humankind, but this fallenness was countered by a belief that, through practice, one could learn to love and thus partake in Christ. This would begin to transfigure the world here and now. Resurrection and deification do not just belong to the end of time for Maximus, but are prefigured in the lives of humans who put to death within themselves an attachment to power, wealth, greed, selfishness, and other distractions that drag one away from being able to love another human being. To oppose conditions of oppression and violence, and to work towards living in a manner that minimises suffering, is thus much more consonant an aspiration for Christian theology. In this respect, despite metaphysical differences, the deconstructive and constructive aspects of anarchist thought, such as those found in the writings of Kropotkin, Malatesta and Ward, bear some similarity to the theological task of learning to become human in this life. Anarchist critiques are essential for deconstructing the myths of statehood and illuminating its role as an instrument of oppression and defence of the property of the elite. Theological and philosophical traditions that lean on the idea that the state is more an instrument of safety than it is of oppression ignore the voices of those who are trodden down in order to maintain law and order and work hand in hand with those who preserve the illusion of the state as a benefactor. The state is not a benefactor, nor even a distinct entity. It is a structure of human relation, characterised by an imbalance of power that is informed by economic disparity and built to maintain that disparity. 
essential to its existence is the use of violence, which ensures that a majority at the bottom fall in line with the desires of those at the top. Various instruments of the state go a long way to sanitising this relationship, with the illusion of popular input and the depiction of the state as an us through careful control of the media. But as many of those who look closer at the flow of money in governments are starting to realise, none of this covers up the fact that the state still remains a violent relation structured to maintain wealth disparity. It is not a great theological trial to persuade theologians that the state is an instrument of evil. The larger problem comes with imagining something that might take its place. The examples of working anarchist organising, as suggestions for what a stateless society might look like, play a hugely important role in challenging the prevailing view that nation-states and corporate oligarchy are as good as it gets. Whilst much, much political and theological will is not interested in such an anarchist angle, it is necessary to demonstrate that anarchically organised societies could be a real possible alternative to the state, both to eliminate the excuse that there is nothing better than this necessary evil in ethics, but also to persuade those theologians who genuinely desire an alternative that such a thing exists and has working examples the world over. There are foremost theologians in Catholic, Episcopal and Greek Orthodox traditions who subscribe not to the view that the state is an instrument of good, but that it is at best a necessary evil. Anarchist criticism of the state and its demonstrable alternatives for society could thus be an extremely important tool within theological ethics for dismantling the state from its sacrosanct role, and particularly the way Christianity has sanctioned and supported its brutal activities in the past 2,000 years. While support for authoritarian power has been a consistent part of Christian history since Constantine, its more anarchic past is older and has also a more continuous, though quieter, history. From the acts of the first disciples, who shared all possessions in common and acknowledged no social rank between one another, to the Basiliad, a hospital run as a commune city by St Basil of Caesarea during the 4th century, or Cenobitism, where a vow of poverty and a simple communal life centred on prayer and working the land was promoted, beginning in the Egyptian desert and inspiring centuries of monasticism to come. All the way down to medieval movements like the diggers, ranters and anabaptists, and beyond that the radical red priests that came out of the Oxford movement, or the Catholic workers, or the 20th century liberation theologians and so on. The older lived tradition of giving to those in need and building places of hospitality, places where the borders of society are broken down, is also a legacy of Christian theology. Whilst there have been Christian anarchists, for as long as there have been those calling themselves anarchists, there have been limited instances of theological attempts to articulate the problem of living under contemporary states or offering alternatives. Anarchist, and particularly anarcho-communist thought, with its emphasis on collective as well as individual well-being, can thus offer a kind of thinking familiar to Christian communal and monastic traditions, whilst pushing to expand the place and possibility of the communal on a wider scale. Anarchist thought also, in its better iterations at any rate, has the poss potential to offer a rich intersectional critique of all power and hegemony, a particularly valuable tool to develop in theology, given the tendency of many churches throughout history to support authoritarian violence. There is thus a great potential for Christian ethics to receive anarchist critical and constructive ideas as part of a mental infrastructure for considering the world, developing both a greater awareness of how interconnected exploitation, capitalism, corporate power and the state are, and how the intersection of these creates a space that is incompatible with Christ-like love. Thank you for listening. To help others find Anarchist Essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies? For over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history, theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.